Um, type them so we can get them answered in context. I always hate try having to go back to a question at the end of a session that I did at the beginning because then I got to remember what I presented at the beginning of the session. So if you get that chance or the question arises, feel free to ask it when we're going through. So, and this was, I kind of went through that slide a little bit quickly. This was going to be adaptive components in Revit. So I've been presenting this this year at every conference I've been to. And I actually presented it a little bit last year as well. And I know a lot of us see people present on adaptive components. So my, my take on this has been for the last year and a half is everyday uses of adaptive components. So it's not just the adaptive components and what are you doing with them, but how can we use these in an everyday environment? I know if you you know know who Havard um, Bashog is, he does a lot of crazy adaptive components in the structural world, like space frame. I've done that on my blog as well. It's going on some sort of twisted building. But how can we really use adaptive components on a day-to-day -day basis? So we're going to talk about what are adaptive components, how are they used, what are some of the pitfalls and nuances of them, and then how else can we use those to get going inside of things. So um, to follow up with this, and that is my last PowerPoint slide, so we're done with that. To do one follow-up on this, is this did motivate me. So what I've been slowly doing is doing a series of adaptive component webcasts, to our, excuse me, on blog posts starting on Monday this week. So each week I'm going to do an adaptive component blog post talking about what are the template types, you know, what types of templates can we use for adaptive components, then getting into how are shapes created, how do we, you know, do points, etc. And I'm basically going to take the handout that I've fudged a little bit here and there for each of the different conferences and talk and have it posted on my um, website via blog for here's all the different uses of these adaptive components, here's nuances and things to look for. So that's going to be in my blog, so if you guys are interested in it, you can just Google the Revit Geek and you'll find my blog, um, and we'll start going through a lot of that. So you're going to see me refer back to this a little bit at the beginning. I'll probably open up some yet, yet posted or open up blog posts as well. Instead of doing PowerPoint, I figured I'd take you to the blog so you'd be familiar with it. Mine as well. But the first thing is, is just by a show of hands, how many people here have actually used an adaptive component? I want to see a show of hands, you know, who's, who's used adaptive components? Who's went through and played with them a little bit? You know, because for me, it's one of those tools where I know there are people out there saying everything you should do should be an adaptive component. Go into adaptive components. They rock. They're the new families. Ignore all the normal families. And I disagree with that in a lot of ways, but I do agree with it in a lot of ways, too. So we've only probably got about 10% of the people who even use the adaptive components. So... What an adaptive component is, and we'll just kind of come over here and we'll use the simple example to start with. So this um, sloped um, footing here, this is an adaptive component. And so what an adaptive component will do is if the object adjusts, like the wall, you'll see that, of course, in Revit, the strip footings are going to, or the continuous foundations are going to move with it when it goes through. So if I take and move this, the continuous foundations that's just a normal Revit component. What's happening is this adaptive component is hosted to those footings. So when I come through and change anything on this, this adaptive component does exactly what it's supposed to do. It adapts with the object. So it's just kind of some uses of where are we going to be going with this adaptive component. So that's really what an adaptive component is. It's something that you place and it'll adapt as it goes through. And last year, one of the things I presented, and I don't think I have that available today, is like casing around a window. So rather than having a window, double hung window, and a single hung window, and an awning window, all these different window types that I have to keep putting a casing into, and maybe on my project I got one of each of those window types. What I did in that case was I actually had an adaptive component where I would pick the four corners of the wall. After I picked the four corners, excuse me, the four corners of the window, then it would just say, hey, here's the four corners of the window, here's the face of the wall, and it would move and adapt with the window as it went through. So just kind of trying to open your eyes of, gee, how can I use these on a daily, daily environment? How can I use these to benefit what I'm going through and doing? So I'll show a couple other uses of adaptive components. They're not all going to be structural. I know I kind of have some structural things here. I'm going to bounce from file to file. But this is just a simple sloped roof that, you know, pretty much every building is going to have some variation of a sloped roof when we get into it. Even if it's a flat roof with a slope, it's still a sloped roof that what I'm going to try to do is come in and get into the adaptive component that's going to be a roof cricket. So this is probably my most commonly used adaptive component that people have been using and going through. But we're going to go through and set this up. So I'm going to go to two ways to do this. One, just like any other family, you can go to component, browse through the, the type catalog to find that component, 
or what I usually like to do with most of my families is just go down to the um, family browser, come down to, in this case, it's a generic model. I thought, I guess I do not have it. Do I not have it loaded? Ooh, I don't have it loaded in here. So I guess I'm going to have to go load the family. So let me go browse back to my folder and let me find my roof cricket family and load it in here. Nice. Oh, you know why it's not loaded? Because this is one I usually go through and I create. So I guess we're going to have to probably create this one first. So we'll ignore the roof cricket family for a second and we'll go into um, a different family. So another use of a family that you might have, and you can kind of see here, I'm going to do a structural version here as well, is like this adaptive plate. So I've got a plate, and I want this plate to obviously figure out what is the angle of this beam, what's going on with it, and trying to figure out this compound angle, not impossible, but probably difficult to do. So this family is going to be called my structural connection. And under my structural connection, I've got what I'm calling um, my connection fixed. You'll see that most of my families are called, this is a stepped footing, it's four points. This is this object, it's one point. This is this object, it's six points. I try to go through and say how many points this object is to kind of help me remember how to place the object. So when I'm dealing with adaptive components, the first thing I like to do is grab the host objects that I'm going to be putting these adaptive components on and isolate these with my sunglasses. I'm going to go isolate those two elements. And the reason I do that is when you're doing adaptive components, a lot of times you're going to need to spin the object around that you're hosting it to, twist it, do some weird things like that with it. And having only those two objects isolated in an extremely large project becomes really nice. So that way I'm not spinning the model and having it go off into Never Never Land. So I'm going to isolate these two beams. I'm going to go grab my structural connection. And then with this structural connection, what I need to do is make sure it's set up here to be place on face. Because if it's set place on work plane, it's just going to try to place it like on level two. But if I have place on face net selected, then I can start choosing different edges of faces or different faces themselves when I start going through and doing this. So I'm going to go through and find endpoints. Um, it might take this a while um, to update. I'm not on my network, so sometimes it takes a little bit larger. So I'll grab the endpoint. I'll come down here and grab this you know, edge on this surface. And the one thing that you're noticing as I place this adaptive component is if I see the preview, I know Revit is going to place that adaptive component. What I've learned with adaptive components is that at some point in time you place it and you stop seeing the preview, a lot of times that means the object is broken at some point in time and it's not going to be placed for you. So as long as I keep seeing that preview, I'm going to come through here, place this adaptive component, and you can see there is my beautiful adaptive component, beautiful being a relative term. And it's all set up the way I wanted to do. This adaptive component in and of itself has um, nested components into it, and that would be the bolt heads, allowing me to go through and choose how many rows of bolts do I want, how many um, bolts do I want in the columns, and going through and tweaking and setting that up for whatever you feel you're going to need for your situation. Will it adjust the bolts based off of the size of the plate? Um, the bolts do adjust and stay equally spaced based on the size of the plate. And you can set that up anyway. I know um, the structural engineer in my life will say, well, yeah, actually the plate size would be determined by the bolt spacing. You could set it up that way too if you wanted to. It's whatever you need it to be. But what I'd like to show on that, again, using the adaptive component type scenario here, is if I grab all of these beams and then decide to move those beams up or down, again, the adaptive components are going to do what they need to do in the fact that they're going to adjust the angle, adjust everything on what they need to do, and I still have those plates adjusted to set up to that beam. So this is where it really becomes useful there. It's kind of a pain to place sometimes. Um, you might have some other issues with them, but for doing what they're doing and as designs start to change, they really, really, really work well. So you can also see this is a terrible example of a clevis and rod. So I'm going to come over here to this little roof scenario. And you can see that I've got this, this clevis and rod. And this is another two-point adaptive component family that I've created. And the reason for this clevis and rod, same thing. If I take the little plate, and by the way, this is an out-of-the-box structural gusset. So I, that's not a custom little plate I'm moving up and down isn't anything custom. But notice as I take that plate and start moving that plate, the adaptive component's moving with it. It's twisting on the other end. Things are all doing what they need to do. So in a scenario on something like my clevis and rod, um, what I'm going to do is I'm still set in place on face. I'm just going to come over here and, you know, arbitrarily pick a face on this, um, this gusset plate. What I'm going to try to do is get, attempt to get towards the center of that face. I'll be able to go through and tweak these points in a minute, and I'll show you that later. But I'm going to pick the point on that face. 
you know, I've got this gusset plate here, but technically I could pick the corner of this beam if I wanted to do that. I could pretty much pick anything I wanted to. I, again, I'm just going to try to, and this is where I should have isolated those points first. <laughs> um, I'm going to rotate this around and then come down here and just pick a point on the edge of that gusset plate. Were you laughing with him? Yeah, yes. he's laughing because I said you should do this, and I forgot to do it in the next step. So now that that's done, I've you know in this case I've got properties for the end rotation. I only wanted maybe this to come in six inches as opposed to a half, depending on how you set your families up. Again, just one of those things allowing you to go through and change properties just like you would any other family. That's not the, the key thing here. It's just really going through and changing those properties. So that's where you can really start coming into some of those situations. You know, I've seen people with, with standard plate families, et cetera, and they're all, this works great. But it's just, you know, getting this object to adjust with the things as I need them to adjust. If I take this roof and just say, wow, that roof needs to, you know, move down two feet. I move the roof down two feet. The plates are base-based family. They move with the roof. I've got the gusset plate, or the, excuse me, the clevis and rod associated to that gusset plate, so it moves down and goes with it. So one of these real beautiful tools and how you use those adaptive components. Now, with that said, there's nothing saying that an adaptive component, you actually have to use those points associated to something. So if I come down to my adaptive component, I think I loaded before the session, but I had four rivets open. I don't know which one I loaded it into. Go down to generic models. Did not have it. So another family that I have that's adaptive is this probably not everyday uses for most people on this presentation, but this is definitely one of those things that one of my clients, they do use this quite often because they do airports. But one of the things, issues that they were having is we really need to create a jet bridge, and we need that jet bridge to be able to be pointed any direction, be any length from this point, you know, that's attached to the building, the fixed distance, to the flexible distance, to the angle going around. And I thought that this would be a great reason for an adaptive component, because in this case, this adaptive component isn't really going to be hosted on anything, but what it's doing is it's allowing me to have multiple pick points to not only set lengths, but to set angles at the same point in time, which is impossible to do in any other family. So if I just go ahead and load this into, yeah, I think that was right. So if I just go ahead and load this into this project, what I can do is go place the component. I knew it was in here already. What kind of family was that? Let's go component. We'll see if we can find it. Love some rod. Did I miss it? There it is, jet bridge. So I'm going to go place this jet bridge. Now in this case, I don't want it to be hosted to any particular face of an object. What I want this to do is just be placed on a work plane. So I'm just going to say place it on work plane. I'm going to place it on level one. And if we're pretending like there was a building here, I'm not going to interrupt that building, I could just pick an area, edge to place it. Wait for Revit to think. I don't know why it's taking it a second here. Okay. Is it live or is it Memorex? It's live because it's freaking out on me. I'm going to escape. There we go. It was working. So let's try that again. I don't know what was going on. Try that one more time. So I'm going to pick a component. I'm going to pick a place for the first point. Then I can pick a point for the second point. And again, you know, if you had some, like, lines in the plan, you could, you could adjust it with lines. And then where I want the third point to be. And then this last point, you're going to see, even though I'm placing it randomly out here, this isn't going to be the length. This point out here is only controlling the angle of that last scenario of where that should be going towards the plane. So you'll see that if I come back here and grab this adaptive component, I can see the four points I picked when I'm highlighting it. And if I come over here and just select the point, I can then drag this point around and really start to change. You could see that, hey, if the plane pulled up over here, oh, more than likely, oops, more than likely it would be at an angle over here, we could start getting that to adjust around. So it's one of those beautiful tools that you can just, again, grab those points, move them wherever you need to move them, and start to see how this thing adjusts going through it. And this isn't hosted. It's just the fact that I wanted a multiple pick point family to allow me to adjust for angles. Then, of course, if we go back into the 3D view of that project, ooh, too many projects open. That was the right one. If we come back into the 3D view of this project, I also then gave myself the capability to have a height at point 3. So I come over here and say, oh, the height at point 3 needed to be 12 feet. And I type in 12, and that's just going to move that up and down. And you'll see all that is is in relationship to the other adaptive point. So that's really some of the you know scenarios and where you can use adaptive points, what's going to be going on with these. You know, 
try to get you thinking outside the box of, hey, it doesn't have to be a panel on a crazy, m twisted, weird mass that everybody pre presents. It can be used more day-to-day -day environments that you might be using in your office. So how are these adaptive components created? Well, the one that I always like to start with is, it's a, in my mind, a fairly simple adaptive component, and that's my roof cricket family. So I'm going to go ahead and start with a new um, family. And what you will see on this week's blog post is what templates do I have when I start doing adaptive components. Well, one of the templates you're going to have is curtain panel pattern based. You're going to have generic model pattern based as well as generic model adaptive um, so depending on what you're looking for. So I'm just going to start this one off with a generic model pattern base. And there's really not a huge difference between generic model pattern base and adaptive except for the fact that if you start with a generic model pattern based, you aren't allowed to add additional adaptive points. So you're constrained by the grid system you choose and how many adaptive points you want. So if I wanted, you know, something that was going to be square, which I did, this is one of the best ways to start because I don't have to think about coming in here and changing the adaptive components or adding the four points and going through and setting them up. I just start with this template. Because even though it's called pattern-based, it still is an adaptive component family where I can randomly pick those four points. So when you get into a, any adaptive component family, you start making points, you're going to see that I've got point one. And if I select this, it's point two, point three, point four. So you've got those four adaptive points. You'll also see that when you're looking at those points, they all have basically three work planes. They're X, they're Y, and they're Z work plane we can use those work points or those work planes to associate everything, other things to it. So with that said, I'm going to come in here and I want to host a work point on the horizontal plane of level two. So you're going to notice that when you're in an adaptive component family, if you've been in the massing environment, it's very similar to the massing environment. So you've got a lot of similar features in, you know, the massing tools that you would be using. So if you come down here, you've got you know, the reference lines and models. You'll notice there's no create shapes. There's no um, you know, create form, create extrusion, sorry, create extrusion, sweep, blend, any of that stuff. It's all just going to be done with reference or model lines and paths and everything else. It's more like doing blend, it's more like doing um, sweeps, not sweeps, sorry, um, lofts like you have in other modeling softwares. So it's going to work similar to that. So I'm going to come up here right now and just do a reference point. On this reference point, I want to get hosted onto the work plane of this adaptive points horizontal work plane. So I'm going to hit the set button. And when I hit that set button, I'm going to say I want this to be the work plane, and then I'm going to host a point on that work plane. Now, it looks kind of weird because it doesn't really look like anything happened, but what's cool is I can take that point that I've hosted on that adaptive component and move it up and down. And what you'll notice, if I change the size of this work plane grid, to be something different, then it's going to move right along with that point. So as the size of the grid changes, that point moves and goes along for the ride. Okay? So with that said, what I want to do now is draw some additional reference lines between these points. So I'm going to go grab reference and I'm going to grab line and I'm going to make sure my 3D snapping is turned on. This is huge in the adaptive component environment. Make sure my 3D snapping is turned on. I'm just going to draw a reference line from my point one up to my new hosted point. I'm going to draw it from point three to my new hosted point and from point four to my new hosted point. So I'm just trying to create this roof cricket and where I think the top surface of that roof cricket is going to be. Okay? But I'm also going to want to be able to do some math because I want to have this family automatically determine the slope based on the run. So I'm going to go do one more reference line making sure 3D snapping is chosen from point two over here to point four. Okay, so all I've done so far is add one point and four reference lines. What I want to do is now set the work plane on this reference line simply because I want my dimension to go vertical because I want a dimension between those two. So I'm going to again go hit that set button, but this time I'm going to tab to get the vertical work plane of this reference line. And then I want to do is go do a dimension from my point two to my point four. And the reason I did this dimension is I want to come up with a um, re uh, reporting dimension on how long this run is going to be. So I've placed a dimension. I'm going to add this label. I'm going to call this label the run. 
and I'm going to make it an instance-based run, that's a or an instance-based parameter, that's a reporting parameter. I'll go ahead and say OK. And so now I can report what that value is going to be. And again, if I go back and change the size of my grid, probably maybe that 15, not 1, but I can see that my run value is changing and see that these reference lines are all hosted correctly and everything's working nicely for me. So now that I've got the run, I'm going to use the run to push the offset of this point. So if I come back and select this point, you're going to see that there is an offset value hosted on that, associated with that point. So when I start coming through to this offset value, I'm going to click the little browse button and add a parameter for this, and I'm going to call this my rise. It's going to be instance base. I'm going to say OK. So now I've got the run, I've got the rise. But I want the run, along with my input value of slope, to tell me what that offset is going to do. So this is normal family content creation at this point in time. So I'm going to go ahead into my family types, and I'm going to create a new parameter. I'm going to add a new parameter. I'm going to call this one slope. Make it instance-based. I'm going to allow my users to come in and say something like, oh, it's a quarter inch per foot slope. Got the inch mark. So if a user types in quarter of an inch, I want that to tell me what the rise is going to be doing. And I don't think this is in my blog post quite yet, but I do have this in the handout that I'm stealing it from. So basically what we're going to be doing is normally it's rise divided by run to come up with um, the value of that. So what I need to do for the rise is say it's the slope, I think it's slope times um, run. And I need to then take that whole thing because this is Revit. I could be doing the wrong thing here. I did not do that. I said put that at the end. I missed the key. Divide that by one. So now you can see what's happening is, is as the run changes or as I change this slope, it's going to update the rise. So if I hit the apply button, you're going to see that going up and down depending on the slope for the rise. Oops, I didn't mean six feet. I meant six inches. Okay, so I'm just using this value to push it. Okay. So that said, now I want to do is create the roof cricket itself. So I'm just going to do a surface. So I'm going to grab those three reference lines that we've got drawn. I'm going to say create form. Now in the massing and or adaptive component world, if you say create form off of a flat object, it's going to ask, do you want an extruded shape or do you just want a surface? And in this case, I truly just want that to be a surface. So I'm going to grab those three reference lines on the other side, create a surface again, and that basically is my adaptive component family. So now with that said, I'm going to go ahead and load this into the project. Sure. I'm going to come over here, find my roof. I'm going to isolate my roof so I don't spin it and go crazy. And then I'm going to go ahead and place this adaptive component family. So what I'm going to do is come in here. I probably should have given a name. First off, make sure I'm placing it on face. And then you'll notice when I host this object, I'm going to come in here and start placing it on these edges. So I come over here and say I'm going to place it on that edge. I'm going to place it on that edge. Again, you'll notice I'm still seeing my previews. I'm going to host it somewhere here on the valley. But wait, what? This is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. i got a 6 inch per slope foot. This thing should be sloping up. But if you notice on this, this is actually sloping sideways. And this is kind of one of the weird nuances in Revit when you start going through and doing this. But if I go back to this adaptive component, what you're going to see is all of your adaptive points have a property. Pulls out a little bit. What's called Orients 2. Now, this was changed in 2015 Release 2. So if you're in 2015 or older, you're going to have slightly different... Um, options inside of here. I think this is called orientation in 2015. And then if you're in 2015, when you hit the drop down or older, um, you're going to get different versions of this. It's going to say like host, it's going to say um, XYZ, always vertical, then Z. It's got all these different options in there. They renamed it in 2015.2. But I want this to be, is I always want this to be a global um, Z and then off of the host XY. So basically I'm saying always go vertical in the Z direction, but then do whatever the host object is doing for the X and Y values. So I always want mine going vertical, so I'm going to say global Z, then host XY. I'm going to reload this into my project, tell it to overwrite, and now you're going to see that that roof cricket 
automatically went vertical. So again, one of the nuances in any adaptive component family, and the thing that will confuse you, it still confuses me to this day, is what is the orientation or the orients to on the adaptive points. This one is huge. You'll get a family, you'll get it done, you're like, man, this should be working. Why isn't it working? Why is it going sideways or up or down? And you'll notice that you'll probably have to change the orients to on each one of those adaptive points. And it is technically each adaptive point you've got to change it on. I've accidentally missed one and only changed it on three of the four, and the family broke every time I tried using it. So just be careful when you're looking at that when you go through and set that up. So now, the other thing that's really cool about adaptive components is you'll notice that, you know, hey, I've got this roof. I don't even know how wide this roof is. Let's just see how wide it is real quick. So it's 20 feet. So I've got this roof at 20 feet. I really wanted this to be the same 10-foot distance from the end that I am from the edge. If I select the adaptive point, not the cricket itself, you can select the cricket, but then you've got a tab to get to that adaptive point. But if I grab that adaptive point, it's got a whole bunch of properties associated to it as well. So now what I can go through and do is say, okay, I want to change this location. By default, the measurement type comes up as a normalized curve parameter. And in my blog post, or if you've been to any of my sessions, it's actually defined in there. So my blog post, I think in the next week or two, it's going to define what all of this means. But when I start saying it's normalized curve parameter, it's basically a ratio between 0 and 1. So if I go change that to, to point 2, you can see that's moving this back, but it's still maintaining its relationship to that valley, which is the host in this case. But I don't want to have a normalized curve parameter. I want to be able to determine how far away from the edge is that. I want it at 10 feet away. So I can come in here and say, give me a segment length, type in any segment length I want, and have that value start updating to that segment length. Then if I go back and grab the roof and see what is my slope of the roof, well, that roof is a quarter inch per foot slope. I'm just going to come in here, grab this, and say I should be a quarter of an inch, and boom, I've now created a roof cricket, which is flat at this edge, but then is sloping accordingly to make up the difference. So this is one thing that I completely love about what's going on with this roof cricket family is I've now got this being flat, setting up what's going on. But what happens if that roof changes? So maybe I've decided I want to come in here and grab this roof, and this side isn't going to be a half of an inch like the other ones were. I want this side to be a quarter of an inch. Oh, sweet. Revit rounding. Anybody ever seen that? I must have screwed up and they're screwed around this project. That, let me try that again. So if I grab this point, it says half of an inch. But if I click on it, it says a quarter. Or in the properties, it says a quarter. If anybody's ever been frustrated with that, the out-of-the-box template, the um, slope, rounds to the nearest half of an inch. I have no idea why that would be set up as a default, but I'm going to go change that. So this one's a quarter of an inch. This one's a quarter of an inch. I want to make one of those a half of an inch, right, which is going to shift my valley line. I'm going to finish the roof. Did I miss it? Try that again. I might have missed it. I forgot to hit it. So that's a quarter. That's a quarter. I forgot to hit enter. We'll make this one a half of an inch. We'll finish the roof. The valley line moves, and check what, out, what happens to that cricket. It moves the valley right along with it. Okay, so this is one of the beautiful tools that you have in, your, in your, your repertoire now, is you can use these adaptive components to go through and do what's going on. Now, the other problem you're going to have with this, and sometimes it'll break when you go to place these objects. I'm just going to spin this roof around to the other side. Is a lot of times when you're placing adaptive component families, you're going to think you're picking on the right endpoint, but you might miss it. So what I always like to say, and I'm going to see if I got it right on these. I probably did because I was really paying attention. If I go change something on this normalized curve parameter, is it going to move that direction or is it going to move this direction? The one thing about when placing adaptive components is you really got to pay attention to the face you're picking it on. And certain adaptive components, if you don't pick the correct face, they can break on you. This is, again, another one of those huge nuances of adaptive component families. So a lot of times when I go place these components, rather than trying to get the endpoint, I'll come over here to this edge and just randomly pick it. You know, and then rather than trying to pick the endpoint of this valley, I'll randomly pick there. You know, and I'm not picking the exact edge of these objects all the time. I'm just, you know, getting close. And the reason I'm getting close is now what I can do is grab that adaptive component point come over here and say, well, that should have been 0, not 0.8. Let me come over to this one and say, gee, this one should have been 1. Again, it's a, it's a value between 0 and 1, not 
0.9. Grab this point here and say probably should have been 1 as well. So I'm using that to make sure I've got it set to the appropriate host. So if you're not sure about it and you're first starting to use this, that becomes a really big tip. Where that will really come into play, come in here and zoom around to this. Actually, I'm just going to isolate these three things to start with. <clears throat> isolate elements. So where that really is going to come into play when you're looking at something like this structural footing. When I'm placing it, I need to make sure I'm picking these ends, I believe, as well as the end over here. You can also see that I've got this. It's got point one, two, three, and 4. So again, I'm just going to delete this and go place this one again. So it's very similar when I come in here to this. What am I going to be doing with this? I've got my, my step footing. And I'm going to come down here, and I'm paying attention not to get to that end point, because notice how when I hover right there, the, the, the view I get. So when I'm hovering on the side, it's going the wrong direction. When I hover over this end point of this object, trying to move slightly, it's going the right direction. So again, picking on the wrong face can try to make Revit go, oh, no, this isn't going to work. So a lot of times, maybe you just want to pick this edge right here. Right? So rather than trying to hover over the end and I'm barely moving my mouse to get it to change, maybe you just want to pick like right here and get it to go. So just play with it as you're doing these adaptive components, but also as you're troubleshooting them, you could be saying, man, this family isn't going to work, and you place it four times and it doesn't work, then all of a sudden the fifth time it does work when you place it. Most of the time that's simply because you didn't choose the right face. So now as you can see, I place that adaptive component. I pick those points, I go back and reset everything, and maybe I'll just stretch this wall up or down, boom. You can see that that structural footing is going along with it. So one of the other nuances, downsides in my opinion, of adaptive components is if I look at this object, these are all structural foundations, right? If I go to the, type, the properties and I look at the property drop-down, that's a structural foundation. But yet when I look at this, this um, step footing, it's a structural connection. When I look over here at my roof cricket, it's a generic model. So one of the things that you're doing as you start creating these families is you've got to choose what family type you're going to want this to be. So what category is it going to be associated with? The biggest frustration to me with adaptive components is I have an extremely limited quantity of structural, or excuse me, of any category that I want it to be. If I'm doing something structural, the only option I have is structural connection. I don't have roofs as an option. I don't have floors as an option. So you're very, very limited in what you can use to create adaptive components out of. You do have windows. You do have doors, which to me is kind of odd that we've got those. I've used it for those situations. But there's so many other situations where I want to use this. So that is one of the nuances. When you're going through and creating these and you go to, like, a roof plan back in the project, I can't, in my roof plan, get this to turn off of visibility graphics if I go to roofs. I can't make it associated or part of a roof. So when I turn that off, I'm still going to have roofs sit there. I'm going to have a different line weight for this object than I am the roof because I don't, can't associate it to that category. So also be aware of that, that the connect, you're very limited in what your categories can be for your adaptive components. So if you're trying to do a schedule of foundations and you really wanted to schedule your step foundations, you're not going to be able to schedule this as a foundation. So just be conscious of that when you're going through and setting those up. Okay, so you've got adaptive points, you've got reference lines, but if we go start a family from scratch, I'm going to use this as my example. I'm going to hide the slab edge here real quick. The one question that always comes up, and this one's actually new this week, so this is um, a, newbie for every, a new one for everybody watching this session. One of the things that I get questions from architects and engineers on all of the time is I want to show a thickened slab under my wall, but if the wall moves, how do I get that thickened slab to move with it? Or if the thickness of the floor changes, how do I get the thickness of my, my thickened slab to move up and down with it? So in the past, I've seen people create beams for this, and then they align and lock the beam to the wall, but then they've got to play with the offset of the beam depending on the thickness of the slab and do all these different things. Well, in my mind, this is an adaptive component. Now, what's cool about this adaptive component is you're going to see that if I kind of spin around, I'm going to go into wireframe real quick, that if I grab this adaptive component or hover over it, you'll see that there's this arbitrary random point not anywhere near that object. Well, this point here is what's called a, sh a shape handle point. 
So it's an adaptive point, but it's not a placement point like the numbered one. This is what's called a shape handle point. And what's cool about a shape handle point is you can use that to associate to something else. In my case, I have associated it to the underneath side of my slab. And then I can use that, that object to tell me how thick or how far offset or anything like that I need this to do. So it's going to automatically change the offset of how far down this is from the lower part of the wall by using that point. So if I go open up this family and edit this family, you're going to see it's a little bit different than the other one. I started this with a generic model adaptive. It's a two-point family. And then what I have is a, a shape handle point over here that will just pull up so you can see it. And that shape handle point is giving me a distance from the original point, allowing me to then see how far down this needs to go. So yes, I did move it up. I do have it being an absolute value, never a negative value. So you'll see what I mean by that. But this is kind of one of those new components that I've got created where, wow, I really want this to go through and get set up and do what I need it to do. So we'll walk you through how I created this one so you can start to use adaptive components and shape handle points. So I'm going to go ahead and do another new family. And this time I'm going to grab the generic model adaptive. And then all I'm going to do is start off with two, adapt or two reference points. So I'm going to go create a reference point. The template I used before had reference points already associated to them, or adaptive points, so you didn't have to do this. And this is something you can't do with a generic model or an adaptive component pattern based is because you can't add additional points. So I've just put two reference points down, and I'm going to select those two reference points and tell Revit I want those to be adaptive. Okay? So I've got two adaptive points, and they're going to number them the order you created them. So I've got adaptive point one and adaptive point two. <coughs> right? So, so far we're looking the same as this one here. And when I did make those adaptive points, I could have selected a point. I'll just drop another reference point over here off to the side somewhere. I could have selected that point, and rather than saying make adaptive, I technically could come over here into the properties and say what kind of point is it? Is it an adaptive placement point, or is it going to be a shape handle point? So you don't have to do it through the ribbon. You can also do it through the properties as well. So right now I'm just going to delete that point. So what I wanted to do is now that I've got these two points set up, is I want to create a path for the loft that I'm going to be creating to follow. So what I did is I did a reference line. I made sure my 3D snapping was turned on. I'm making sure that I'm snapping to adaptive point one and adaptive point two. Right? So now that reference line, if I take this point and move it, it should go ahead and move right along with the point. If I take it up and move it up, it should move up and down with the point. So I've got a reference lines associated there. Then what I'm going to want to do is have a profile or a series of profiles that I can sweep this along. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to host, and this is how I like to do it. I know a lot of people do this slightly different, but I'm going to host a reference point on that reference line. So again, I just did reference point. I made sure my 3D snapping was checked, and then I hosted it right on that line. Similar to what I showed you in the project environment with the roof cricket, I have the same measurement types and normalized curve parameters. So if I want to move this up and down the line, I can move it up and down the line by changing the curve parameter value. I can give it a segment length, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can do whatever I wanted to do to get this set up. So a question just came in on, that's great, but all of your reference planes on your adaptive points are the same color. How do you really know what they are, which way is up? You don't. Um, that's been a comment that I've made, which would be great if I knew the Z planes were one color. If you select it, you can tell by the gizmo that comes up when you select it. So it's showing you blue, which is going to be your Z value, red, which is your X, and Y, which is your, or excuse me, green, which is your Y. So if you select it, the gizmo does show you what's going on, but I'm not going to get that on a point that is hosted. I'm only going to get that on placement points off to the side. You couldn't drop something in there that would leave those colors on there until you were done? You could host something on it to give yourself colors. So unhosted points will give the same thing for you, knowing there's three work planes. But hosted points, they just don't show you that gizmo because they're only allowed to move inside of it. The other thing about that on any point is you notice that when I select this point, it's showing me, since it's hosted, only the one work plane. And if I come over here and grab this one, it doesn't show me any of them. There are properties on those points. So if I come over here and it says show reference planes, it says never on that one. I can say when selected, it'll then show those to me. Or I can come up here and say always show them. 
So even though this is just a standard point, it's not adaptive, I can make it always show me um, the, the uh, reference planes associated to it if I want to. And that's also true of any reference point. So this one was automatically hosted. It set it up to be when selected. But I could say always show me the, re the reference planes associated to that. The other thing that's weird on, um, on that is there's a little checkbox that says show normal reference plane only. So that does let you know in the programming world which is the normal reference plane. So in this case, that's thinking it's the normal reference plane. I could also do that for any of the normal other points. So if you really want to know which is the normal reference plane, or in this case, this would be the X or the host, it's going to give a point to you there. Is that point hosted on the X or the Z? This point is hosted on the line. So this point here is going to move with wherever that line goes. So it's perpendicular to the line that it's hosted to. So if I, I have that hosted on the line, so that normal point is perpendicular to the host object. So it's not hosted on X or Z per se. The point is hosted on the line, depending on what happens to that line, is where that point that um, point's going to go. Okay. So the other thing that anybody who's ever taken anything from me understands is I like to label everything. One thing I love about points is you can also give the points a name. So I can come up over here and say this is the center line of the path. I can give all of these points names because if we go back and look at my family, I like to use points. I'm going to hide this um, extrusion for a second. I like to use a lot of points and to know that, hey, this point, its host is the center line of the path or whatever it's going to be. If I grab this point, this point is that the is hosted by the haunch CL. Which point's the haunch CL? Well, that's the center line of this haunch. So I like to go through and name all of my points. So when I'm looking at points going, how is this point related to another point? They go through and give me um, set up for anything on that. So another question came up is for foundations, you could add the kern points. I don't really know what that means because I'm not a structural engineer, so I don't know what a kern point is. But I'm assuming yes. So for me, this is kind of how I go through and, and get this set up when I'm doing that. So I'm going to go back to my family. So what I did is I hosted a point on this point that would allow me to move it down. So I'm going to go do a reference point. I'm going to set the work plane. And I'm not to set the work plane to the normal of that point. I'm going to tab until I get to, okay, that's just weird, showing the point always. I'm going to say um, when selected and not only show me the normalized. Okay. So I'm going to come up here and do a reference point. I'm going to set, I'm going to tab on this point to get its, what I'm going to call Z reference plane on this case. I'm going to host it there and then pick that host. You are going to see this a lot if you go about it my approach and the fact that I get this, hey, there are identical points in the same place. I'm okay with that because what I'm going to do is take this now point that's nested on the point and just play with the offset value to move it up or move it down. So you can see I play with the offset value, it moves it down. So I'm going to go ahead and offset this, and I'm going to say, you know, this parameter is going to need to be something similar to however that thick of that slab is. The, so, cent the central area of a horizontal section of a wall, column, etc., within the, which the resultant force of compressive loads must pass through. Uh, so yes, you could do a current point, because this is going to be hosted to the center of the wall, and that point right there is technically the center of the wall. I knew that off the top of my head. Yeah, right. Chris is over here Googling that for me, for me, John. So I knew it was something to do with like center of mass or something like that. So yeah, technically you could do something like that if you needed to. So I've got this point, right? Um, positive is down. It depends on how that point is set up. So if I wanted positive to be up, then what I would do is rotate my point 180 degrees. So this is a little tip that I have. Um, I'm going to make sure I add this to my blog. I forgot to put this in my handout in the last few conferences, is you can rotate any of your points. So if it's going the wrong direction from what you think you wanted it going, I can just go back here and say that's zero, and now positive is down. In this case, it really doesn't matter to me. I just need to get the point into a location. So what I like to do is host points on points on points. The other thing that could happen, and this is one of the nuances, is you could bring in a generic model as a profile. So one thing you're going to find out about massing or adaptive components is you cannot use a profile family inside of here. However, you can go create a generic model family, use model lines in that generic model family, and create it like you would a profile, add parameters, etc. 
you can do it that way. Sometimes I do it that way. Sometimes I don't. The day I created this this week, I was in a mood for just doing points. So all I'm going to do, and normally I would label all these points, so I'm just going to start getting into hosting points on points. And in this case, I'm hosting two points inside of there. Then I can play with the offset value here on one point, play with the offset value over here doing a negative distance on this point. Right? So I've got those points as we rotate around, hosted. If I take this point and change its value, right, you'll start to see that the things are moving for me. Okay, <clears throat> then I can start going through and doing reference lines. I'll do a reference line from this point to this point. Then I'm going to host a reference point on this point to this point. Then I'll host another reference point. You can just start going through, and what you'll see is I'm just hosting points on points on points. And what you may notice on here, and this is something I always like to point out, I think this was a brilliant thing to do by the programmers. If a point is hosted on a line or a surface, it becomes small. If a point is hosted to another point or free-floating, they are large. So it's really nice for me to start understanding that if I just put a point in here, that I can tell if it's hosted on another point or hosted to a line, and it really lets me just visually see the difference between the two. I kind of wish it's like if it was hosted on a line, it would be one size. If it was hosted on another point, another size, and free-forming would be a different size or color or something. That would be cool, but in essence, this is all we have. So as you can start to see, I've got this point. You know, I did these points. You know, I start to go in there and give myself a width. You know, I've got a width value for my foundation, and I've got a width half value. So I can go and say, hey, this, this foundation is going to be three feet wide, and then I've got a half width, which just offsets this half the distance. You know, then I've got a foundation step. And so I'm not going to bore you guys with me placing 500 points as I go through this family. What you can see I did is I hosted this point to that point, and then just what you saw, and then I just parameterized some of this. So if I grab this point here and I go into its offset value, you'll see that I parameterized it to be width half. And I've got a parameter in here called width half negative. So it just takes the width half and negatives it. So what, what I do, and this is kind of how I work sometimes, not all the time, just depends on the mood I'm in, honestly. Um, I've got the overall slab width, which is 36 inches. Then I came up with a width half, which is just width divided by 2. And then I got a negative width half, which is just half a negative of the width half. And I just kind of start setting some things on that when I go through and get this set up. Hey, here's my width base. Here's my whatever you want to do inside of there. So feel free to play with that however you wanted to play with it. Um, that's just kind of how I set up all the points. This point was here, so this point could be hosted on it. And then I connected those points with reference lines. Okay? You'll also notice that there is a little point right here. And this is what struggled I struggled with a lot um, in the Revit world. I originally did all of this point hosting way back in the day when I did things like this to the reference point one. And remember when we had this reference point one, we have the value to say it's going to be set up to the global Z and then the host XY. But the problem with that is, is it's going to not necessarily be situated perpendicular to the line. It could be set to the host. So what I started finding is when I did all of this stuff down here hosted to this point, my families kept breaking on me. And what was happening is this was staying perpendicular to the point, not the line. And what I mean by that is if I take this adaptive point over here and rotate it, I'm um, sure delete that dimension, I don't care for a second. Notice how the nodes or the planes on this adaptive component are always x, y, and z. They don't rotate as the point rotates. And this was huge when the light bulb went off in my head on this one. That if I hosted to the reference plane on that point, it was always going x and y to the project, not to the object I was hosting it to. So my workaround to that was to go in and start hosting points on the, the object and then just moving those points to the end. Because this point is hosted to the reference line, therefore always perpendicular to the reference line. So this is another one of those crazy little nuances. So in a scenario like this, um, I also created an adaptive point. And that adaptive point, I switch to become a shape handle point. So it's a shape handle point. And then I set up a work plane of the vertical grid on my point one. And I just dimensioned from this point one's horizontal plane to my shape handle point's horizontal plane. And again, made this a reporting parameter. So that's what makes 
this move up and down, move up and down the foundation itself. Okay? So I can do that back in my other little family real quick to kind of show you what I did. I'm going to come in here, and I'm, I'm kind of weird. I like these things to line up as I create families. I'm going to go do a reference point. They don't have to. I just like to set these reference planes up. I'm just going to do it on a work plane. Work plane is going to be level one, and I'm just going to dump this point over. You don't have to do this. I'm just a little OCD about certain things, and I, I find it makes life easy. So now that I've done that, see, now I played with this. And I'm only showing normal. Um, now that I've done that, what I want to do is take this and make it what's called the shape handle point. I'm going to take that shape handle point, and I'm going to move it up. Now I want to do, what I want to do is do a dimension from point one to the shape handle point. So I'm going to go set a work plane. I'm going to set the work plane to be the z axis, the z axis on my placement point one, or one of the vertical axes, I should say, so my x or my y, not the z. And then I'm just simply going to go do a dimension from that horizontal work plane to the horizontal work plane up here. So no matter where this plane moves to, it's picking up on that value. It moves up, it picks on it. It moves down, it picks on it. It's always reporting that value to me. I'm then going to take that point. I'm going to go add a parameter. I'm going to call this my slab report. Forget what I called it in the other project. I'm going to make it instance-based, and I'm going to make it a reporting parameter. Okay. So now that I've got that slab report done, what I want to do is come back up here, and you'll remember that I created the slab thick parameter. Well, whatever that slab thick parameter is, I want it to match the slab report parameter. And Revit's going to yell at me when I hit apply, because this is an instance base and this is a type based. I forgot to make it instance, so I'll go back and make that instance base. Are you able to copy the center of the profile to the ends, or do you have to create every point on the... Um, I'll show you that in one second, Brandon. Unfortunately, I could copy two of the points, but not all of them, which is why probably I would have used a profile, but I already did the points once, and I wasn't thinking exactly what I was doing. But I'll show you that here in a second. So you can see that as I move this point up and down, um, that's moving along with it. But the problem is I didn't ever want this to possibly move above the, the family. And you'll notice that it really doesn't matter. This is what's really cool about adaptive points. I move it down, it goes down. I move it up, it still goes down. So it's what's beautiful about this because what's happening is even though this is coming up with a value, as I move it up or down, it's always a positive value. So it's not giving me a negative scenario. However, I like to always be careful, so I believe... I actually came up with absolute. So what I did is I created the slab thickness, and then for the thickness that that's being offset, I went in and created a parameter that says when you match that, make it an absolute value. So if for some reason you ever get a negative value in that, always make it positive. Because if I ended up with a negative value, there is a chance this could go up. There shouldn't ever be a reason for that, but in the event there was, I wanted to just get that by the wayside. Okay. So what Brandon's question was, are you able to copy all of this, or do you have to do it each time? So here's a little tip about hosted objects. If I grab all of this stuff here and I use the control key as I drag, it copies it all and drags it with it. This point is still hosted on there, so you'll see that if I go in and say this should be point 0.29, it moves back and forth. But notice the only thing that did move with it. Unfortunately, when you do that, it only copies one deep. These ones over here are still technically associated with that point. So that's kind of the drag when this happened. So just to let you know, no, you really can't do it. So it would probably be better off to bring in a generic model that had a profile, map all those parameters to what you needed in your project. I honestly just did this once because I thought it was going to work a different way. It didn't. So I was like, oh, screw it. I'm just going to recopy it. Like I said, this was created last week. It hasn't been refined yet. But because what I thought I was going to do is I thought I was just going to be able to grab these reference planes, this reference plane, and say create form, which you can see it did. Looks like it's going to work beautifully. But the problem I started having is when this point started moving up and down, <laughs> it kind of started decided to bow my family. So I originally only did the one profile because I thought I'd be able to just sweep it about along that path and be done with it. But then I started realizing, and this is, again, another one of those fun nuances, that when I started moving that adaptive point up and down, these stayed where I originally had modeled them that original distance away, and the rest of it started going. Great tool if we ever need to do a cambered beam, but not really what I'm looking for in this. 
So that theory did not work. I was not able to just grab the center profile and do it. So that's where I said, okay, I need to copy it to the end and do it again. Had you nested a profile, a generic model with a profile on here, and you did the control drag trick, it would have brought that along with it because that would truly have been hosted to that. So you would have been good in that scenario. <clears throat> okay, so we've got that set up. So I'm just going to come in here and delete this real quick. So what I did after that scenario is I then took all three of these extrusions and just said create form. All right, so once I take those three shapes and say create form, I now basically ended up with the same thing. If I truly wanted this to go to the end, be flexed all the way to the end, then what I need to do is come in here and add a parameter for where does this point end up being on the end. So I can come up in here and say end indent or something like that. You know, I could make it instance based if I wanted to. And I'll say this one is coming from the beginning and it's at point 0.01. I'm going to come over here and grab this point and change it to be the end as opposed to the beginning. And then what's cool is I can apply that same parameter to both of them. So I'll apply end indent to that one. I already did it to this one, so we're good. And now if I come back here and start playing with that end indent value and maybe I'll go make it point 0.2, you can see I can move it in equally on both sides. I could have made a start indent and an end indent and get that set up that way, but in this case, I could do it as one. And so that's really that family and all I did to create it. So how does that family get placed? Go ahead and delete this. I'll go back into a shaded mode. So when I go to place this family again, what I'm going to do is just isolate my wall. So I've got my wall isolated. And then I'm going to go ahead and place this component. Again, I'm kind of zooming under the wall. I'm going to find the midpoint. And I'm looking for the bottom face of the wall, not the edge face. I'm going to grab the midpoint of that bottom edge. I'm going to pan over here and grab the midpoint of this bottom edge. And boom, that is now associated to the wall. Right? So if I come up here and grab my wall, I move my wall sideways, it's moving right along with it. But you'll also see right now, it's pretty much set to the thickness of the level. So it hasn't adjusted itself down. So I'm going to go back and unhide my slab. I'm going to find that shape handle point. I'm going to rotate to the bottom of my slab, and then I'm going to say I want to pick a new host for that shape handle point. When you're picking a new host, it, you only need to do this if you're picking the underneath side of the slab. If you had a level there, you could just come down here and say, hey, that's going to be associated to level 2, and it's going to have a zero offset on level 2. Boom, now you can see I'm up here to the height of level 2. This is going to move up and down as the level moves up and down. In this case, I don't want it associated to level two, so I'm going to pick that point, say pick new host, and I can pick anywhere on this slab. Now, on that, as that slab thickness changes, it might be under the wall, it might be way the heck off to the side, it does not matter. It's just going to be set here, and as my slab thickness changes, it's going to change right along with that slab thickness. So one of the downsides to this tool is I'm going to have to join it to the other structural these are slab edges. I'm going to have to just use my join command to join this to the slab edge. Boom, it cuts it back. You'll notice since I did it as one slab edge, it did it automatically on the other side. But the downside is, is since this is technically, oops, wrong level, since this is technically not a structural foundation, part of the reason why I get frustrated, I do not get the dashed lines here. So what I need to do is go into a wireframe, and then I'm going to go to my modify tab, I'm sorry, my view tab, I'm going to say I want to show hidden lines through the slab. I want to see that object hidden. I go back to hidden lines, then you will see, boom, now I see my dash lines for that structural foundation. So kind of one of those cool things that there you go, there's another everyday use architecturally and structurally. Got the lines hidden, it adjusts with the wall. Even if I make this wall go to some weird angle, pull the wall over here, it's adjusted, it's there, it's doing what it needs to do. So it's kind of another one of those things of everyday uses of adaptive components. Um, look at my blog. Um, we did have one question come up um, from John. Point can associate the load and you have a deflection indicator? Um, you, if you want, you'd have to be manual input for a load that was doing some sort of controlling on that value. 
Um, yeah, you could do something like that if you needed to. You're getting pretty complicated, but yeah, you really could start getting into something and doing that if you wanted to. Then as for the deflection indicator, it depends on what you want that to look. You're limited to the types of families you can nest into and have work properly into an adaptive component. So most families can nest into an adaptive component, but adaptive components cannot nest into any normal type family, only other adaptive components or masses. Okay? So with that said, um, like I was saying, really pay attention to my blog. I've got this one thing on um, everyday uses of adaptive components. It's like I said, um, I pulled this out from my handouts that I've done in the five conferences this year. Uh, I'm going to be adding to it because, you know, I'm constantly developing these things. And then the last showstopper that I always like to show everybody um, when I do this, and I am over time right now, but this should go really quick. One of the best uses I've ever seen that I actually came up with on the fly is an adaptive component that's still a generic model because you can place walls or roofs on the face of it. So I am just going to go do my generic model pattern based. It's going to be the fastest family I've ever done. I'm going to grab the four reference lines that come in this. I'm going to say create form. I only want this to be a surface. I'm going to load that into my project. And I will put it into this one because there's less stuff. Okay, so I've just created a four-point adaptive component family. Well, let's say for whatever crazy reason you needed to figure out what this wall was doing. I was actually working on the San Francisco um, air traffic control tower. If anybody's seen the images of it, and it's a, for lack of better terms, is an hourglass-shaped building with twisted panels going around. Those panels have windows in them, and inside that building we've got to get walls to follow the curve of the window, but yet be vertical on the other end. So what I did is I did this. You've seen it. I did this. That's what I did. So now I can go place this component, right? And I've got four points adaptive. I'm going to go from there to there. Oh, we're not going to go all the way across. We'll just go from here to arbitrarily there, right? Oops. Did I pick the bottom of the slab? No, it looks like it went through. It's like middle. I did pick the bottom of the slab. See? Pick new host. Not a big deal. I should have been paying attention a little bit more of where I was in that slab. There we go. So there it is. This is a generic model. I don't know if everybody knows this, but what's really beautiful about the wall by face tool is you can do the wall or roof off of the face of a generic model. So I now have done a wall to warp, adapt, fit. Or if you didn't want it to be a wall, let me delete that out. Let me go do roof by face. Let me make this and say create roof. Boom, I just did a roof. Because oh, I started with a structural template on this one. Roofs are turned off. Um, I just did a roof by face off of that shape. There you go. The cool part is if I come back here and grab this adaptive component, and let's just go say we needed to move that adaptive component, I can then grab the roof and say update to face, and boom, I've now just adjusted that. So one of those things where you've got some weird shape and you've got to get something on the surface from all these four points or six points or seven points or whatever you might need to be doing on there, adaptive component, roof by face, wall by face, um, boom, there you go, curtain system, you're good to go and you've just set those up. So this was huge when I came up with this scenario going, oh, wow, yeah, we just did this wall that had to go into the curve and be vertical on the other side. I didn't have to do anything crazy. I just did an adaptive component and hosted it. So with that said, I appreciate everybody spending a little bit more than an hour of their time to join us for this webcast. Um, yeah. Look at the blog. You'll see more stuff coming on the blog. Um, I blog. I try to blog every Monday. Occasionally I blog in between if I have more time, but I usually try to blog it every Monday. And if you have any other questions or anything, feel free to email myself or the, the folks over at CAD1. Exactly. And hey, hey, I mentioned this earlier on Revit Radio, and I know there's new people on this one, uh, but if you guys have any outdated software, we can't, um, no, Revit Radio was before this, actually, John, um, but uh, if uh, anybody has any outdated software that's not on subscription, we basically got until January 30th to get that current. We've been trying to get this out to everybody. We've been calling them, sending out emails. Um, pass it along if you know anybody that has that. We can't we can't uh, harp on this enough that uh, after after um, February 1, you'll have to buy brand new. So uh, hit your salesperson up. Hit me up. I'll get you to your salesperson. If I'm not your salesperson, again, this is Chris Porter. Uh, call Stan. doesn't matter. Get in touch with somebody, and we'll get you guys updated. So. 
Otherwise, on that note, we appreciate everybody spending time with us, and we hope to see you again in the future. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye.